Okay, so you'll be talking about reviewing 200 years of Nova Scotia geology, gypsum caves, and mastodon sinkholes. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, some great talks so far. Um, so I'm going to um, just jump right in here and get rid of my thing there. So over the past um, year or so, I've been doing quite a bit of historical research, looking back 200 years on the history of Nova Scotia geology. And um, this sort of depicts that timeline of 200 years. Um, we've been looking at the, the folks in Nova Scotia marked in black, as well as the organizations uh, in Nova Scotia in black, uh, New England geologists, in blue and a European or British or Scottish in, in yellow. So um, this work has been interesting in providing an opportunity to, to look at these lenses of time or significant um, periods in Nova Scotia's geology. And this timeline also allows me an uh, opportunity to look at uh, things like uh, gypsum exports through time. Um, you know, there was a really uh, the the period of the the first and second world war were quite disruptive to Nova Scotia geology. But soon after that um, is when you saw really sharp um, increases in, in gypsum exports. Um, and so I'm going to be talking um, about gypsum and the fossils that we find in the sinkholes uh, through this these five periods here. And um, there's really no place better to start than at the beginning, perhaps. Um, so back in uh, this, this first period of Nova Scotia geology, we see New England geologists playing an important role. So Parker Cleveland was a professor of geology at Boyden College in Brunswick, Maine. He wrote um, probably the, the first description of mineral sites in Nova Scotia in his uh, mineral uh, and geology, mineralogy and geology treatise. Uh, first published in 1816, and he basically said that gypsum occurs in Nova Scotia, but he didn't know much about it. And I noticed that in his second edition, he noted things like uh, agate was found at Partridge Island, uh, and he was citing that he got this information from Thayer. And this is the second edition published in 1822. So I became interested in who Thayer was and found that Solomon Thayer in Newback, Maine had written several letters to Parker Cleveland, and they were in the Boyden archives. So I got a copy of those and have transcribed them. So we see in 1819 that Solomon Thayer had written to Professor Cleveland, who had been his teacher at Boyden College. Um, and he said that um, he was sending him uh, specimens of plaster, but also noted uh, in one portion of the letter that in all directions uh, from the quarries in the vicinity of, of uh, Plaster Quarry at uh, Windsor, holes are frequent in the earth like a tunnel or amphitheater consequence of the plaster underneath being worn away by water by some other cause. Uh, I think this is the first um, earliest evidence I've seen um, of description of that karst terrain in Nova Scotia. Uh, as a little aside, I've also um, been able to identify that those original specimens of gypsum that Solomon Thayer sent to Parker Cleveland are still in the Boyden College Department of Geology. These are 200-year-old samples uh, that are still used in their education program. So coming from Parker Cleveland's uh, work, Charles Jackson, who was studying medicine in, at Harvard, um, then came to Nova Scotia with his friend Francis Algier, over uh, several years, and uh, they then published the Mineralogy and Geology of Nova Scotia. Um, and this is where we get the earliest geological map of Nova Scotia. Um, they also uh, published a little description about the gypsum, and I think it's worth noting what they, again, said that uh, around Windsor abounds a concentrical and or inverted um, funnel-shaped cavities supposed to have originated from the solution of rock salt. Um, and also they went on to say that uh, in one of these caverns or caves, 10 or 15 years before they were there, which was in 1827, a skeleton of a human being supposed from the relics of arrows 
found to have been Aboriginal. So these would be the atlatl points. Um, so it was discovered in, in the gypsum quarry in one of the caves. They then uh, went on to say that they were shown the skeleton by Reverend King, who was uh, at, at the college at the time. But they also said um, that basically these, um, no one had yet looked at whether other uh, remains of animals living or extinct may also be entombed. So I think this was, so this is 1833, um, um, that they are projecting the um, idea of sinkholes. Uh, in 1855, we see Dawson's uh, geology map of Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island that also included Cape Breton. So I'll use that for this reference here and, and zooming in on the Bredour Lakes area to relay the, the information conveyed by Thomas Halliburton in his history of Nova Scotia that Remains of vast animals are found, which um, would appear to have formerly ranged in Bredour Lakes. Uh, enormous bones resembling thigh bones, six feet in length, are reported to have been lying at the bottom of the lake. It's very clear water, and um, so you can envision these large bones sitting at the bottom of the lake. Um, in 1834, this is where we see the, the mastodon femur uh, from Middle River was collected by a farmer uh, tilling his field. And when you look at both of these localities, you see they're underlain, of course, by the Windsor gypsum. And uh, I would point out, uh, I guess, that they would be great candidates for having come from uh, sinkholes, and if you imagine this whole area around the border, Bredore Lakes um, dissolving this uh, in Windsor gypsum, and these uh, any fossils in that in those sinkholes would just drop to the shore. Dawson did describe uh, the femur as well as a tooth, uh, mastodon tooth, in 1868, and these are still in the collections of the Nova Scotia Museum, some of the oldest uh, fossils in the provincial collection. The second period of uh, this phase of uh, looking at the gypsum and, and karst and, and sinkholes um, would relate to Henry Howe, who is a professor of mineralogy and natural history um, at King's College, uh, also um, the name bearer of uh, howlite, a, a mineral found in the gypsums. Uh, by uh, Henry Howe. So he was important for describing the, the actual chemical mineralogical elements of the, the gypsum and um, wrote uh, a description for the mineralogy of Nova Scotia that was dis um, displayed or included with the 1862 International Exhibition in London and also contributed specimens of gypsum that were then displayed um, in London. Um, I'm interested in these historical collections and was wondering whether they would be able to be tracked down. But the 1864 report says that those uh, gypsums were, were uh, donated to a military college in, in Britain. The third phase, just before the First World War, um, very exciting time for Nova Scotia. And in terms of gypsum, we see William uh, Jennison uh, producing the gypsum of the Maritime Provinces, a very uh, extensive uh, focused report on the gypsum, um, looking at the industrial um, uh, uh, resources that have been established, as well as the geological context. And it's here that we see um, some of the first detailed photographs of a working quarry here shown uh, around 1910, the Newport Gypsum Quarry, and you see these wonderful depictions of the or records of the, the horse-drawn carriage. So any gypsum that was basically mined at that point was literally lifted by hand onto a cart and then uh, taken out. Um, now, some of these uh, photos are now going to be historically interesting to, to consider um, from a structural um, point of view. This time period is also important because of the International Geological Congress um, uh, of 1913, where you had international geologists from around the world uh, coming to, no to Nova Scotia as part of an excursion to the Maritime Provinces. Uh, we have a detailed excursion list. I've found also Charles Schuchert's 
handwritten uh, notes from his trip um, to Nova Scotia. And we have, ex you know, sort of growing uh, photographic evidence during this time as well. Lots of excitement coming to Nova Scotia. And um, this was really, unfortunately, dissipated with the, the First World War and um, a lot of sort of disruption of the progress that had been made. But um, one of the people involved in that excursion and some of the, the Nova Scotia studies that supported it uh, was um, Goldthwaite, who produced the physiology of Nova Scotia. And again, he's uh, giving more attention to the, the surficial features and noting the karst terrain. So this, um, uh, before the wars, was all this energy was building up, and it was uh, only um, after the Second World War and sort of into the, the late 1950s that we start picking up another story. The museum has changed its name to the Museum of Science um, and hired Bill Take as the, the first focused uh, curator of geology for the museum. So Bill Take and uh, uh, Jane McNeil, from the, also from the museum, worked a sinkhole, the, uh, the Milford gypsum quarry, this photo shown in 1958. Again, I know not um, occupational health and safety um, appropriate for today for sure, but uh, they collected uh, quite a bit of interesting material. So here you see the two geological hammers and a field notebook and a vertebra on the, on the, the book. Um, this material would, would uh, only be described uh, later. Um, so this is um, 1990 Harrington describing the fossil beaver, uh, Castor canadensis, um, that he attributed to late Sangamonian, uh, 80,000 years old. So 1958, uh, Bill Take and Jane McNeil collecting material, including the beaver, some mollusks, uh, some um, uh, seed cones, and uh, uh, frog bones. So the, these other things uh, are still yet to be fully uh, described and uh, studied in the literature. Um, from Bill Take, we then see uh, a new um, uh, period, I guess, in terms of the Mastodon studies with uh, Bob Grantham, at, who is now the, the uh, at this point, the curator of geology at the Nova Scotia Museum. Um, and he got a phone call from the Bailey Quarry in Windsor, where Alan Wilcox, uh, one of the excavator operators, had uh, located um, some uh, bone of interest and uh, on going to the site, they, uh, Bob was able to recover a large mastodon tusk and the material was um, unable to be, you know, more material was unable to be found. It was sort of being, had already been worked over. So that's 1989, but 1992, uh, Bob Grantham, again, uh, working with Kelly Cazera, um, uh, responded to a call from this time, the Milford Gypsum Quarry and a sinkhole. So there's a building uh, that was established where the sinkhole had been uh, found. Um, here's Kelly uh, at the sinkhole face. Uh, these photos from Bob Grantham um, and a working view in this building structure in the middle of winter um, and uh, the mastodon bones being collected uh, from the, the pit floor. So this is the famous Milford mastodons. We have adult and a juvenile, again, uh, about, about 80,000 years old based on uh, carbon dating of wood and bone and teeth. Um, but there's also turtle, um, mollusks, uh, clams uh, and uh, other seed cones and dung that had been uh, recovered. Just a, a really great snapshot of uh, this uh, Pleistocene uh, time period. Uh, Bob did some really great documentation. So he often uh, photographed things as stereo pairs, um, that, which would be, you know, uh, younger folks wouldn't understand what those are, basically just uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, but uh, with uh, 35 millimeter slides. So. We can take those today and combine them with software and um, use those to combine with his uh, field map um, to produce the 3D scan of the block from the slides and then plot those into three-dimensional space. 
So this is just a sort of testing of a uh, concept where we can three-dimensionally reconstruct the, uh, the bone bearing layers as they were coming out. Uh, sort of the more recent is the 2014 uh, Little Narrows Mastodon sinkhole. Um, a few limb bones were recovered, but it was uh, sort of, again, already quite reworked uh, and dated at late Sangamonian uh, time period. So that's from Catherine Ogden and John Calder uh, uh, permit report. So we've been talking about uh, Pleistocene mastodons in sinkholes. And most recently, some really interesting things coming to demonstrate that the um, sinkhole data goes back to the Cretaceous. So um, uh, Falcon Lang, Fensum, Gibling, and others um, published about the karst-related outliers uh, of Cretaceous chasswood in, um, that are exposed at Bailey Quarry and Avondale, again, in the Windsor area. And they uh, have also published um, results of that work that also identify the oldest pine fossil uh, going back to 130 million, 135 million years uh, recovered from these uh, sinkhole deposits or karst of Nova Scotia. So uh, during this work, I've also taken an original sketch that was done by Derek Davis um, in 1991 and sort of reconstructed it, added the Cretaceous fill, shows you the modern cave and karst system and an example of how that modern system is a, an analog for the Pleistocene sinkhole where Mastodon material and other stuff has been found. And also we have this record going back to 130 million years. So there could be sinkholes that would record time periods anywhere in between there. So that's uh, a depiction of uh, sinkhole and karst through uh, the 200 years of history. Um, and a lot of uh, help along the way from various people. So I'm very grateful. And I will try to squeak in to have a couple minutes of questions if possible. <laughs>